In this video, we're going to focus in on phase transitions involving solids and really take a step back and look at the thermodynamics of phase transitions from a bird's eye view, looking at heating curves, how to understand and apply and use heating curves, as well as submicroscopic molecular models of phase transitions. So first, let's start and just note that phase transitions may involve solids as the starting point or the end point, the reactant or the product, if you like. And two phase transitions involving solids are freezing, in which a liquid goes to the solid phase, and melting, in which a solid goes to the liquid phase. And of course, at the melting point, the solid and liquid phases have equal stability, they are in equilibrium, and the rates of melting and freezing are equal. Now there are also phase transitions involving the conversion of a gas into a solid or vice versa. The conversion of a solid directly into a gas is known as sublimation, and the conversion of a gas directly into a solid is known as deposition. When it comes to the thermodynamics here, we've encountered enthalpy of vaporization previously. That was for the liquid to gas phase transition. The solid to liquid phase transition is associated with an enthalpy change called the enthalpy of fusion, or delta H fuse. This is the heat required to convert one mole of a substance from solid to liquid under standard conditions. And note that this is a melting transition. The word fusion is super confusing here because it makes it feel like or seem like freezing is going on when in fact the enthalpy of fusion is actually associated with melting. That's an important point to keep track of. And something that can help you remember this is that enthalpies of fusion are always positive and melting is endothermic while freezing is exothermic. Our submicroscopic models of phase transitions can help us reinforce this idea. Let's take a look at that from a bird's eye view on this slide. So what you're seeing on this slide, first let's focus in the middle. We're seeing molecular pictures of the three different phases of water. Here's ice, solid water, here's liquid water, and here's gaseous water. And we know from these pictures and the proximity of the molecules that the strongest intermolecular forces are in the solid phase, where the molecules are closest to one another. In the gas phase, at least to the ideal gas approximation, there are no intermolecular forces at all. So as we move up from the solid to the liquid to the gas, an input of energy is required to break those intermolecular forces. And we can see that in these phase transitions on the left. Enthalpy is increasing as we go from solid to liquid to gas as those intermolecular forces are broken and the corresponding delta H values of fusion and vaporization are positive. Now going the other direction from gas to liquid and liquid to solid of course we are creating intermolecular forces. This has a stabilizing effect and the enthalpy change is now negative so the enthalpy of condensation and deposition for example are negative and we're establishing those relatively strong intermolecular forces in the condensed phases. So this shows you how endothermic and exothermic phase transitions relate to whether intermolecular forces are broken or created. A heating curve shows how the temperature of a substance changes as we apply heat to it at a constant rate. So in your mind's eye, what you should be visualizing when you see a heating curve is that we're moving along the x-axis at a constant rate as heat is added to the sample, and the temperature will generally increase as heat is added to the sample at a rate that depends on the heat capacity or specific heat of the substance. However, we notice regions where we're adding heat, but the temperature is not increasing. These are locations where a phase transition is taking place. So for example, this longer line up here shows the conversion of liquid water to gaseous water at 100 degrees Celsius. And the heat we have to put in to affect that evaporation process, let's say we're dealing with one mole of water here, is the enthalpy of vaporization. These enthalpy changes of phase transitions are also known as latent heat, and I think, I think the heating curve really gives you a sense of why this is. The heat is being applied, but the temperature is not increasing. So on some level, the heat is latent. It's not going towards a temperature increase. We see a similar thing going on in the solid to liquid phase transition here at zero degrees Celsius. And the heat applied here, of course, is the enthalpy of fusion, which is considerably smaller than the enthalpy of vaporization for water. Now, the slopes of the lines are also worth paying attention to here. 
One thing to note about a heating curve and a heating curve graph is that we have heat or energy on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis. And we've seen quantities that relate heat and temperature before, namely heat capacities and specific heats. So the slopes of these lines are related to the heat capacity of the substance. For example, this line tailing off here is related to the heat capacity of water vapor, gaseous water. Specifically, the slope is 1 divided by the heat capacity of gaseous water. 1 over the heat capacity because the slope is rise over run degrees Celsius over joules rather than joules divided by degrees Celsius. And here this C is the molar heat capacity since we're dealing with 1 mole of H2O. The slope of this line in the middle, well, this corresponds to liquid water being heated, and so it's 1 over the heat capacity of liquid water here. And generally, this slope will differ considerably from the slope for the gas and solid phases, since those heat capacities are going to depend on the phase we're looking at. And finally, last but not least, the slope of this line at low temperature is, of course, 1 over the heat capacity of solid water, or ice. And again, just to reiterate this, the heat capacity has units of joules per degree C. 1 over that heat capacity gives us the slopes of these lines on the heating curve, degrees C per joule. So you can get a lot of information off of heating curves, and these are a valuable tool, for example, for measuring heat capacities and measuring latent heats, or enthalpy changes associated with phase transitions. Heating curves also provide us with a very useful visualization of how temperature changes with applied heat as we heat a substance through a phase transition. So, for example, th thinking about a heating curve for a problem like this is going to be very useful. The question is, how much heat is required to convert 135 grams of ice at negative 15 degrees C into water vapor at 120 degrees C? And I've gone ahead and just calculated the number of moles of ice we're dealing with here, 7.49 moles. Now, why is a heating curve useful to think about here? Well, we know we're going through phase transitions, and in general, you'd be given the temperatures of phase transitions in order to be able to see this more clearly, but for water, knowing that it melts at zero degrees C and boils at 100 degrees C, shows us that we're going through both the solid to liquid phase transition at zero and the liquid to gas phase transition at 100 degrees C. And in order to calculate the total heat required to get this process done all the way from ice to water vapor, we need to do multiple calculations of the heats to accomplish, for example, heating of the ice, the solid to liquid phase transition, heating of the liquid, and so on and so forth. So thinking about it in a stepwise manner, using a heating curve to really guide our thinking on the number of calculations that we need to do and the types of calculations we need to do is going to be very useful for problems of this type. And again, before you do any calculations, I would draw out a heating curve or, at the very least, diagram out the process in textual form, which is what I'm going to do here. So let's think about this process. We need to kind of stop and pump the brakes at each phase transition because we're going to calculate heat for the phase transitions a different way than we do when calculating the heat needed to just raise the temperature of a substance. So we start with ice at negative 15 degrees C. We're going to heat that until we hit zero. At zero degrees C, a phase transition occurs from solid to liquid. Once that is complete, the liquid gets heated from zero all the way up to the boiling point, 100 degrees C. At 100 degrees C, that liquid is going to boil and form water vapor, and we're going to then heat that water vapor from 100 degrees C to 120 degrees C. So each step of this process is going to involve a unique heat calculation, and each one is a little bit different, as we'll see. So let's start with the first one, heating solid water from negative 15 to 0 degrees C. On the heating curve, this corresponds to starting somewhere down here and riding up this sloped brown line up to the 0 degree point right here, where the solid begins to melt. This is just going to involve an mc delta t, or if we're using moles, the moles times the molar heat capacity times delta t calculation. So I know the mass, 135 grams. The heat capacity is for solid water, for ice. This is important. This number corresponds to the heat capacity of solid water. 
and the temperature change I'm interested in is 15 degrees C from negative 15 to zero. That gives us a value of 4.23 kilojoules. That's just worth noting qualitatively as we're going to compare that to the other heats as we move forward. Now we're going to melt that solid to liquid. How much heat does that take? Well, I know the enthalpy of fusion. I know how much heat is required to melt a mole of substance. How much is required to melt 7.49 moles? I simply take that enthalpy and multiply by 7.49 moles. So number of moles times the enthalpy of fusion, which is a molar quantity, kilojoules per mole, gives me 45 kilojoules to melt that ice to water. About 10 times as large as the heat required to go from negative 15 to zero degrees C. So there's a big jump up in the heat required here. Next, we're gonna heat the liquid water from zero to 100 degrees C. And we're back to an MC delta T situation, now with a different specific heat, 4.18, the specific heat of liquid water, pretty famous number. 100 degrees C is my delta T, and my mass is still 135 grams. And this is even larger than the enthalpy required or the heat required to melt the solid into liquid. Next, we take that liquid water at 100 degrees C, we evaporate it from the liquid phase to the gas phase. Now we are here and we're crossing over this latent heat barrier, boundary, if you like, and we're trying to find the heat associated with this. To do that, we're going to again use an enthalpy change times a number of moles, but now it's the enthalpy of vaporization from liquid to gas times the number of moles we're dealing with, 7.49 moles. And this gives us the largest value in this entire calculation, 305 kilojoules. Huge amount of heat has to be put in because we're essentially destroying the hydrogen bonding interactions in the liquid water completely as it evaporates to water vapor, to gaseous water. And then finally, we're gonna do a little bit of heating to get that gas from 100 to 120 degrees C, that's a delta T of 20 degrees C. We're using the specific heat of water vapor now, gaseous water, and the mass is still 135 grams, 4.97 kilojoules is the result of that calculation. To figure out the total heat, we simply take the heats associated with each of these individual steps and add them up, and the result is 416 kilojoules, and that's pretty straightforward. On some level, that's an application of Hess's law, right? The overall process is the sum of these steps, so the total heat is the sum of the individual heats, 416 kilojoules. So, Keep in mind that you can use a heating curve to really organize your thought process as you work through problems like this. And you'll need to break it up into steps, particularly everywhere where you hit a phase transition from solid to liquid or liquid to gas as the temperature of the substance increases. We needed to know a lot of information to solve this problem too that wasn't listed in the question. The individual specific heats are required as well as the transition temperatures, which were sort of implicit in the fact that we were dealing with water, but for more exotic substances will generally be given.